read together Lord's Day 5 on page 87 of the Green Creed. Lord's Day 5. Since then, by the righteous judgment of God, we deserve temporal and eternal punishment. Is there no way by which we may escape that punishment and receive a judgment into favour? God will have his justice satisfied, and therefore we must make this full satisfaction either by ourselves or by another. Can we ourselves then make this satisfaction? By no means. But on the contrary, we daily increase our debt. Can there be found anywhere one who is a mere creature able to satisfy for us? None. For first, God will not punish any other creature for the sin which man hath committed. And further, no mere creature can sustain the burden of God's eternal wrath against sin so as to deliver others from it. What sort of a mediator and deliverer then must we seek for? For one who is very man, perfectly righteous, and yet more powerful than all creatures, that is, one who is also very God. Beloved, the doctrine of sin, which we have been considering in the last three Lord's Days, is the dark but necessary backdrop for man's deliverance, which we begin today with Lord's Day 5. And know well that we are considering here man's deliverance. Because many angels also fell from their original righteousness, but God provided no way of deliverance for them. All those angels who became demons were never presented with a way back. They were chained in darkness. But God chose a different way with mankind and he saw fit in mercy to deliver some of Adam's lost race. <clears throat> now today we begin our consideration of deliverance from sin from the perspective of satisfaction. That's the key word in Lord's Day 5. Look with me for instance at answer 12. God will have his justice satisfied. And therefore we must make this full satisfaction either by ourselves or someone else a substitute to take our place. Question 13 asks, well can we ourselves make this satisfaction? No. Answer four, question 14 asks, is there anyone who is a mere creature able to satisfy us? For our sins. Satisfy. The key word in Lord's Day 5. And satisfy means to fulfill the obligations. To comply fully with the demand. And to pay the debt owed. If for instance we are in the red. We satisfy our creditors by paying our bills. Here we're speaking about paying the debt and fulfilling the demands that God's justice makes of us on account of our sins. And we and our children need this satisfaction. Without it, we're lost. Consider then this morning satisfaction for sin. It's necessity. We really need it. It's impossibility. You can't look for it in this avenue or that. And then finally, it's possible <coughs> where it is to be found. Satisfaction for sin. It's necessity. It's impossibility. And then it's possibility. Now the necessity of satisfaction for sin is denied by men, denied by both. 
Most obviously, the self-righteous deny the sufficiency of the satisfaction of Christ alone. They feel that Jesus dying on the cross 2,000 years ago is just not enough. And our works surely have to add something to it. And after all, I'm as good as my neighbor, and I think I'm a pretty good person, and I'm better than so-and-so, but you're as good as so-and-so, but I think I'll be able to make it through that God is merciful and Jesus died, and hopefully I'll get through the pearly gates. That's how most people in the so-called Christian world think. And that's pure darkness. Pure darkness as dark as paganism. There are other people too who doubt the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, that he is the only way to salvation. Now we're in the periphery of the Western world, so to speak, but this is a dominant 21st century attack on Jesus Christ. There are all these other pagan religions, and there's a lot of very good religious people in them. And who would we be? Wouldn't that be very arrogant of us to deny that there's some truth and there's some goodness and there's some light in them? And so the satisfaction of Jesus is the only way that's outmoded and outdated. Nonsense, but it fools men. And then there is also a specious appeal to the character of God <coughs> wrongly considered. And within this framework, the mercy of God means that God is so large-hearted that surely he will pity everybody and just let sin pass. That's very popular. And the wisdom of God is such that being so clever, filled with all understanding and knowledge, and allied with this, the wrong way of mercy, God will surely find a way, even for those who've never heard of Jesus, and even for those who reject the gospel, because God has infinite possibilities, and he will let them in somehow or other. And then, not just the mercy of God, or his wisdom, but then there is appeal to God's power. He is omnipotent, and he can do anything, and he can save people, even contrary to the death of his son, or the demands of faith and repentance, and maybe even God so powerful that he can destroy the obligations for punishment without satisfying the claims of justice. And the Bible, on the other hand, and our Heidelberg Catechism summarizing and drawing out the teaching of the very clearly affirms that the justice of God demands satisfaction for sin. The justice of God is such that there is no other way around it to be saved than through the cross of Jesus Christ, that narrow way which leads on to life by which the Son of God took upon himself the punishment due to us for our sins. And when we say that the justice of God demands satisfaction for each and every sin, whether in the cross or hell, which is a sort of satisfaction for sin, we mean that the necessity for this satisfaction for sin is rooted in the very nature and being of God. That God, were he not to demand the satisfaction for each and every sin, would not be God at all. And any God who does not insist on the satisfaction of sin is by definition an idol. That's what we mean. So when we say that satisfaction, the bearing of punishment for each and every sin, is necessary... We are not saying that this is a cultural thing, that this is something that our Western society thinks or used to think. We're not saying either that this is some doctrine that theologians with too much time on their hands have dreamt up. 
It's rooted in who God is. To be even more clear, satisfaction for sin is not necessary solely because God determined that he would send his son to die on the cross. It's rooted in who God is. He demands that sin, which is principally and always against him, as the God who fills heaven and earth, the God with whom we always have to do, that sin against him and his infinite majesty must be punished, must be punished, or else paid for if sinners are to escape punishment. Now here we need to clarify. God did not have to create the universe. It was an act of the free will of God. God the Father had to necessarily generate the Son. The Father and the Son necessarily had to, although perfectly freely and willingly, breathe forth the Spirit and love to each other. That was necessary, but God did not have to create the world. He freely willed and chose to do it. We could also say that the infinitely wise God did not have to decree the fall of man. God could have created a world in which sin did not enter and in which, so to speak, Adam persevered in holiness. God could have willed that. Moreover, God could have willed and decreed not to see it anybody. That would not have been inconsistent with his mercy. His mercy did not require that God elect and so see if some of those who are formed. God's mercy would not have been one less wit, infinite, if he had decided not to see it anybody. But now, this is the point. Given that God did freely choose and will to create the universe, given that God did decree a fall, and given that God did decree to save some sinful, fallen human beings, the only way in which God could have done it, and I speak reverently, this is not a limitation of God, but the only way in which God could have saved some of those human beings who fell and originally were created in the first six weeks of the sin of Adam, the only way that God could have done it is to have sin satisfied and born and punished in a substitute. That's the only way. There is no other way. And we affirm then the necessity of satisfaction for sin upon solid grounds. God has always been teaching this to his people. That this is the only way. This is included in the history recorded in the Bible. Just after the fall, God made coats for Adam and Eve. Coats from the skins of animals. That meant that God had to kill the animals. And blood was shed. And then the clothing points to the righteousness which we need as a covering for us because we're naked without it before God. Right from the beginning, after the first sin, God says there must be satisfaction, there must be death, there must be a covering that isn't your own but that comes from outside you, which I will give for you. And then we have the children of the first pair. They too must bring offerings. Abel understood the gospel, and so he brought to God the firstlings of his flock. He knew that he couldn't approach God but for the sacrifice of animals. And Cain brought vegetables. 
He didn't see the need for atonement, sacrifice, the shedding of blood. And if we move from Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis to the Mosaic Law, we we'll see the Old Testament sacrificial system laid down in the later books of the Pentateuch, underlining the necessity of satisfaction. You want to get to your God? You have sinned. Animals must die. Blood must be shed. Otherwise you can't get near God who dwells in the tabernacle or temple. Otherwise you will be killed. Oh boy. And so God then institutes priesthood and altar and sacrifices and lays it down as to how it must be done. And even the various Old Testament covenants or revelations of the one everlasting covenant of God, all of these were sealed with blood. In fact, Hebrews 9, the New Testament's inspired interpretation of the Old Testament sacrificial system, Hebrews 9 says, summing it all up, with the eye of God interpreting all these sacrifices states that almost all things are by the law purged by blood. Unless you shed blood, it's all filthy, defiled, and abhorrent before God. Almost all things. There are a few things in which you wash with water, but it's almost always blood. Sacrifice. And then it goes on to say, Hebrews 9, 22, Without the shedding of blood is no remission. Can't be remitted sin, can't be blotted out unless you shed blood. Death as satisfaction for sin. Those are historical instances where God teaches his people in the Old Testament. Now, according to answer 13, sin is to be understood as a debt. Jesus teaches us to pray that way too in the Lord's Prayer. Sin is a debt to be paid to God as creditor. We owe God obedience and when we disobey we sin and God says you have incurred debt. And for you to be saved, God says, this debt must be paid. This must be paid because you could think of Satan as it were wagging his finger at God this is unfair of you, Lord. You simply erased the debt that was never paid. That person, indeed that whole church, should not be let in. But it's not just Satan, of course. The point is that the righteousness of God insists that he cannot have people in heaven dwelling with him forever who have never paid the debt of loving him. That demand from the very being and character of God is immutable, constant, and there's no way of dodging it. God, as it were, comes to each and every human being and he knocks at the door day and daily and says, You owe me. You owe me. And we have a place for debtors. It's called hell. There must be satisfaction or else you pay it yourself forever. Now, answer 14 speaks of sin in connection with enmity. God looks upon us as sinful, considered outside of Christ, as it were, with hatred and indignation, and the phrase used is eternal wrath. And when we sin, the justice of God has sufficient, indeed compelling grounds, to hate and punish us. And that ground of the hatred of God must be removed. God can bring people to glory without that being solved and taken out of the way. We can even think too, to look at the same thing from a different point of view of our sin as guilt. It's guilt. Before God, the 
universal judge. If it were the case, just for a minute, that God as creditor could relax and discharge the debt that we owe him, and even if God, as the offended party, could for a moment, so to speak, decide, well, I'm not going to hate sin and sinners, I'm going to let him go, even then, since sin is guilt, and God is the guardian and vindicator of his own laws, which express his own being, he must punish. In fact, the passage we read says in verse 30, Vengeance belongeth unto me. It is a peculiar divine characteristic that God owns vengeance. It belongs exclusively to him as his divine prerogative. I will recompense, I will repay for each and every sin. The Lord shall judge. So satisfaction is necessary. There is no way around it. It's interesting too that in the history of those who attacked the Christian faith, this was a key thing. If you can get rid of the idea that sin needs satisfaction, then people won't feel their guilt and they won't understand the cross, and the Christian faith will disintegrate. Lord's Day 5 is important. This is the first Lord's Day in which deliverance begins. It says, satisfaction is needed. Now since none of us, I take it, wants temporal or eternal punishment, we must then look for a way, God's way, of satisfying for our sins. When the natural man, when he first hears something about transgressions and understands himself to be exposed to God's wrath, his first thought is, well, I must satisfy for sin myself. And so this is how the Heidelberg Catechism also begins. It says in question 13, can we ourselves then make this satisfaction? What about us? Can we do it? And there's a certain rationale to this. I incur debt. And when you incur debt, the logical way of solving it is for you to clear yourself of the debt by paying the bills. God is angry with me, so I must avert and turn away his anger. I'm the one who's guilty, and so maybe I can make myself innocent by changing my ways and working hard at doing good. Then, the person will say too, the Bible is filled with commands. The Bible's forever telling me what I must do. Yeah, God's like that. You have obligations to him. He tells you what you must do, definitely. He's given us ten commands. Well then, if God tells us what we must do, surely he is pleased with keeping the commands. <laughs> And then I can make myself better. If I stop doing certain sins, I know I'll be as evil. If I can do all the things that Christians recommend, like praying and going to church and reading the Bible and giving to serve the kingdom of God, and then maybe if I can weep buckets and cry tears of repentance, and then I can think about Jesus a little, then I will be all right. That's the question. Can we ourselves then make this satisfaction? And the Catechism is very clear. It doesn't say, well, you have a point there. It says, by no means. Not a chance. That is a dead end. No way. You can't make satisfaction for your sins because, first of all, you really don't even want to. That's what it's like to be on the gym. You don't care. You may talk about it, but in you, it is not. You can't will it. And even if you could will it, hypothetically, you haven't got the power to do it because we are so corrupt, to use the language of Lord's Day 3, we are so corrupt that we are wholly incapable of doing any good and we are inclined to all wickedness. And that's our in Lord's Day 5 points out that even if we could do these things, that is, keep all God's commands, 
we couldn't we couldn't do them perfectly. Even if you were to keep them in part, you wouldn't do it perfectly, and God demands perfection. And so it says, question and answer 13, we daily increase our debt. We ought to get a hold of that. Our guilt keeps increasing before God of ourselves, you ourselves outside of Christ. Every day you get more and more into the red and it swallows you up. And if you want to be even more sharp and clear about it, let's just say you could. From today to the day you die, let's say you could keep every commandment of God perfectly. Let's say you could start loving your neighbor like yourself. That's so difficult, it's hard even to imagine. Let's say you could love God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind, just for the sake of argument. Let's say you could, and you kept it up every day until you passed away. Then the question is, what about all the debts you've had in the previous 15 or 30 or 45 or 60 or 70 years or whatever you may be today? How's that going to help you? And then we say, what about all the stinking pride there? That you actually think in your folly that you can keep God's commands? You obviously have no idea of what we are like as fallen human beings or what God requires of us. So, instead of making any satisfaction for our own sins, we just become more and more guilty and our debts keep up. The next thing that we may do is say, well, I can't do it. What about other people? You just told me that I'm sinful. Maybe there's somebody out there who fares better than me and can obtain righteousness. And they're human, and I'm a human being, and there can be some sort of transfer. This is the system in Roman Catholicism. I may not be very good, I'm not a saint, but Michael's a saint, and Francis is a saint, and Dominic's a saint, and they did more than was required for them, and some of their merits could be transferred to me. And then there's the Virgin Mary, and she was a super saint. We're talking about a different Virgin Mary from the one we know in the Bible. And then maybe even on a more holy basis, I've got a brother who's a Christian, or my mother is, and I can sort of hang on to them, and I'll get into heaven on the basis of their good works. And the simple answer to this is, and you know the answer, is that your neighbor is as totally depraved as you are. They can't save themselves, never mind save you as well. And we sign it with that, Psalm 49, verse 7 of them, with respect especially to the rich. None of them can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him, because it's too precious. God isn't interested in money anyway. So you can't do anything to help anybody else or satisfy for their sins because you're in debt and they're in debt too and there's no way out. We're running out of options of course. The other possibility is what about the angels? What about the good angels? The angels have a lot, we might think, to commend themselves to us as possible deliverers. Because the angels are rational, moral creatures. They can think, they know the difference between good and evil. And they're heavenly and powerful and sinless and wise. And the Bible teaches, and it does, that the angels play an important role in our salvation. There is much rejoicing in heaven over the repentance of a sinner. Luke 15. The angels desire and look into the deep things of the gospel of Christ. 1 Peter 1 verse 12. They're an example to us in that. And Hebrews 1 verse 14 says that the angels are ministering spirits sent to minister and serve those who are the heirs of salvation. We have angels that help us in unseen ways under the providence and the control of Jesus Christ our Savior and keep us clean. <coughs> we don't often think about that, but we should. 
This notion of angels is very popular today in the mystical thinking. Not only is it the case that Roman Catholicism engages in all sorts of idolatrous veneration of angels, but in the bookstores, and even the allegedly Christian bookstores, you see all sorts of angel paperbacks about fighting in heaven and how the angels do this, that, and the other. Waste of, waste of paper, um, not Christian speculation, uh, but angels can't do it. And the reason why angels can't save us is, first of all, angels are not human beings. An angel can't be a substitute for a human being. They don't have a human life to enter into our life and to live in our place. And they don't have a human death and they don't die as we as human beings think of it. And so they cannot die for sin. And the wages of sin is death. And when I quoted Hebrews 1 earlier, which is itself a quotation of Psalm 104, that angels are ministering spirits to support and encourage and help us in all sorts of unknown ways to us, they're just helpers. We could say that the office bearers in the church institute minister to the saints, but that doesn't mean they redeem you or pay for your sins. Same as the case with the angels. So you can't do it. Other people can't do it for you. Angels can't do it. The only other possibility that I could think of is the death of animals. The death of animals as laid down in the Old Testament sacrificial system. God commanded it, didn't he? It's a really old, venerable institution. Three and a half thousand years ago it was laid down. Blood was shed. Without the shedding of blood, Scripture says, there is no remission of sins. And there are many other people who in the history of the world and currently have looked to the killing of animals as some sort of satisfaction for sins. Hinduism has some sort of notion of this. And in the apostolic age when Hebrews was written, the Jews believed in it. And then when their temple was destroyed, they couldn't offer sacrifices at the temple. Rabbinic Judaism developed into later Judaism in which they had to explain away the laws of Moses, which they're all insisting on keeping, but they can't because they've got no temple, they've got no priesthood, they've got no sacrifices, they've got, up until recently, they didn't even have the land, so they had to reinvent a new theology of Judaism. But you know, not only is it the case that we can't be saved today by the blood of animals, that but it was the case that even in the Old Testament, all the blood of animals, which must have stunk to high heaven, all the blood of animals did not succeed in removing one single sin. And if you say, well, what was the greatest sacrifice? In the Old Testament system, the answer is the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16. And the passage which we read in Hebrews 10 says, Well, they kept doing it every year, didn't they? Blotting out sins. Why would you have to repeat it if the sins had already been blotted out? And verse 3 even states that every year, when you lay your hands on the animal and impute to sins to him, as it were, that you didn't even just impute the sins of the previous year, you imputed the sins of last year, and the year before that, and the decades and centuries before that, because they weren't removed. And this was part of the ceremony. Verse 4 states, Hebrews 10 verse 4, It is not possible, even for God, not possible, that the blood of bulls and of goats take away sins. And the Old Testament itself teaches this. Teaches it in Psalm 40, which is quoted in the opening 10 verses of Hebrews chapter 10, where Christ speaks, and Christ says, all these sacrifices and killing of animals and offerings, Lord, you didn't really want it, did you? Wasn't sufficient. Didn't do any good, did it? It was only there as a type of shadow for a limited time. And then Christ says, Lo, I come, 
In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will. I know, Lord, that all the killing of animals didn't take away any sins, and so we're putting that out of the way, and my cross is the reality to its pay point that will satisfy for our iniquities. That's the possibility and the reality. The death of God's own incarnate Son. Verse 10 of Hebrews 10 says, We are sanctified, made holy, set apart, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, By that one offering, God has perfected forever them that are sanctified. This is the point of question and answer 15. Jesus is able to do this because he is very man. He has a body as well as a rational soul or spirit. As a human being, he can live and suffer for us in our nature. Man like us. Answer 15 says that he is also very God. He came into the world by an act of his will, unlike us. He came into the world as an act, by an act of his will, as one who pre-existed his conception and birth, as one who pre-existed the creation, because he's God. And as such, he has the power to sustain and bear all our sins. I come. To do thy will, O God. God willed his coming. And Jesus says, I, I come to do that will. He willed the sacrifice of his son as death. Uh, the death of his son as sacrifice for sin. And Jesus willed that. And God accepted it. And if you say, well that sounds all very well. But did the Old Testament saints who were killing animals left, right, and center, did they understand that the sacrifices wouldn't do it and that the Son of God would have to bear our iniquities on the cross? Well, Jesus says in verse 7, which is a quotation of Psalm 40, I come, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So Jesus is saying, the whole book, the volume, what we would call the Old Testament, it's written about me. Me coming to do God's will, me coming to put away the Old Testament sacrificial system, the volume of the book, it's written of me. Jesus was the object of the faith of all the elect saints in the Old Testament as well as the New. And so, Hebrews 10 draws a comparison between Old Testament sacrificial system and what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. The Old Testament priests were sacrificing many, many times, day and daily. Jesus just had to do it once. The Old Testament priests stood to make their many sacrifices. They were standing at the altar. Jesus Christ made his one sacrifice and sat down because it is finished. It doesn't need to be repeated, can't be repeated, and can in no way be added to. Because though the blood of bulls and goats can never take away a single sin, by his death on the cross, Jesus perfected forever them that are, them that are sanctified. In fact, the passage we read together explains in verses 15 through 17 that Jesus' death inaugurates the new covenant. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. I'll put my laws in their heart and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Unlike the Old Testament sacrificial system. <coughs> That's the better sacrifice. I won't remember them because they've been washed away in the blood of Christ, which establishes the New Testament.
So necessary and so unique is Christ's satisfaction for sin that verses 26 through 31 explain that if anybody willfully turns away from it, they will be utterly unable ever to find any other satisfaction for sin. This is the only one. The book of Hebrews being about apostasy, especially first century believers apostatizing with Jesus Christ and going back to Judaism, always brings this out. So if you have someone who knows the truth of blood atonement, confesses it, and then verse 28 despises it, verse 29 tramples underfoot the Son of God and counts the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified according to his claims, an unholy thing, and vilifies and despises the Holy Spirit, willful sin, Then verse 26 says, If we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. That's the only one there is, and you turn away from that, and there isn't any, and you're doomed. The passage goes on to explain that it was bad enough in the Old Testament, when you turned away from the law of Moses and walked in sin in the Old Testament, you know what people would do after there was a judicial inquiry and sentence passed stones stones the whole congregation would come together and pelt you with stones until you die the point of this passage is you think that's bad enough that's brutal that's old fashioned but how it is verse 29 says of how much sore punishment how much worse is it going to be if you trample on the foot the blood of the covenant and despise the Son of God? Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense. This passage isn't talking about the outright unbeliever primarily. It's talking about the saint who falls away. Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense. And again, third quote from the Old Testament, the Lord shall judge his people. Those who professed and fell away. You remember Deuteronomy 33, which states that underneath and round about are God's everlasting arms. That's the comforting way. Verse 31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, to be so entirely under his control that he can crush and destroy you as despising the death of his sons. Powerful angry hands because there's only one sacrifice and satisfaction if you neglect that then you bear your own you bear your own punishment and you perish and this is the wisdom of the cross as the only way that man's power and knowledge could never do it all the other ways are dead ends God said, I will freely offer up my son. I'll deliver him for you all to make a way out. And this too will have a lot to impress upon us the wickedness of ourselves by nature and the evil things that we think and say and do because of the awful punishment which it brings but for the blood of Christ. So that we don't turn away from him and reject it. <coughs> And we live accordingly. And there's one last thing we need to do. It's to see how sacred scripture itself, in this passage, Hebrews 10, applies the truth of Christ's satisfaction. The opening 18 verses of this chapter says there's full, complete satisfaction for every sin. Not through blood sacrifice and old testament, <coughs> but through Jesus Christ on the cross. Then comes the exhortation, beginning in verse 19 with the therefore. Having therefore, brethren, all these things for us, we have blood sprinkled, the blood of Christ, and we're going into a better temple. 
with the holy of holies in which God dwells. We have blood, the blood of the Savior. We have a veil, and the veil isn't a curtain. The veil is the body and flesh of Jesus Christ, which has been torn for us. Then we can walk into the holy of holies, the most holy place, because we have a great high priest who beckons us to come, and we can draw near to God. That's what it means, satisfaction. If that's the case, verse 22 says, let us draw near. You have a priest, you have blood, you have Christ on the flesh, the veil is taken out of the way. Let us hold fast, let us draw near with a true heart. And then, using Old Testament imagery, think of your body as being washed with pure water. That's what Jesus does for us, spiritually speaking. We have a pure conscience because our hearts are struggled from an evil conscience. So we draw near. And this being the case, and us having in Jesus something far greater than all of the Old Testament taught, then we hold fast, verse 23, to our profession of faith, our confession of the truth of Jesus, our clinging to Him. We hold fast without wavering. We don't shake, we don't doubt, is this true? Maybe I should pack it in. Maybe we should return to the world. We don't waver, we don't entertain such doubts. Because Jesus made satisfaction and he is faithful to the promise. And the next verse, 24, makes this application. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We have a sacrifice, we have a sacrifice in the church. So we don't criticize and run each other down, which is hatred. We instead think about it. The passage used the word consider. Let us consider one another and how this will help other people. And then consider them to provoke or stir them up to love. That's our calling since we're all covered with the same blood. Provoke people, consider them to provoke and stir them up to love God. To love their fellow saints and to love their neighbors for Christ's sake, and we stir them up to do good works. That's what our conversation should be aimed at. And then the passage continues not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as we see the day approaching. Since the sacrifice of Christ is the only way, then you do not miss the old service unnecessarily. Everybody's going to miss the old service. You're going to be sick at first. But you're not to miss the old service unnecessarily. Because then the progress is, progress is the wrong word, then you miss two services unnecessarily. You're not there the Lord's day at all. You're not there the next Lord's day. And this is, in the argument of Hebrews 10, the typical outward beginning of apostasy. That's the outward sign that you're drifting from God. That's the argument in Hebrews chapter 10. And that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the satisfaction, the only satisfaction, means nothing to you. You don't foresee the death sending of ourselves together. That's Man of some is in the first century AD and since. But instead you exhort one another not to forsake it, to love one another, to do good works, to draw near to Christ in prayer. That's what you do. And you do that so much the more because the day of Jesus Christ is getting nearer and nearer the great judgment day. I'd say to that, there's no satisfaction.